One of the most human things anyone can do is look at the same thing everyone else's, but interpret it in a wholly different way. The reasons for this are so multifarious, but it is, in no small part, because of our own preconceived notions about how the world works and what this thing in question does for you. The Nintendo 64 may have been your only source of solace as a kid, but for me, it was the clunkier of the consoles and the one I never owned. I bring this up because on this episode of MIS, we're discussing what is perhaps the most thematically heavy scene in one of the most narratively heavy movies to ever come out of the Disney library. Heaven and hell, guilt and hope, radiant light and scorching fire, we're talking about the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and this is the most important scene. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame is quite the anomaly. It's totally inconsistent due to the creators trying to balance out the heavy themes with juvenile humor, a movie that, though successful, was a far cry from the earlier successes of the Disney Renaissance. An admirable film, especially to those like me who first saw it as children and are now full-grown adults. Hunchback of Notre Dame was originally written by Victor Hugo and published in 1831, but it takes place in 1482's Paris, this sets the story close to the end of the Catholic Church's monopoly on European religion. To be exact, it's one year before the birth of Martin Luther, who would go on to lead the Protestant Reformation. The story centers around Quasimodo, a misshapen bell ringer of the titular church. Like all Disney protagonists of the 90s, he wants more than he has. More specifically, he wants to spend a day on the streets of Paris. His mother was killed by Judge Claude Frollo when he was an infant and after a stern talking to by the Archdeacon, was adopted by Frollo and made to live in the Bell Tower. There, Frollo educated and took care of him. He sheltered him and made him feel like a monster, unworthy of venturing out of the tower. And man, did Disney like turning interpersonal relationships into hero-villain ones in the 90s. From Gaston being the village hero, Jafar being the Sultan's advisor, and who could forget good old Uncle Scar. But Frollo is the most cunning and diabolical of them all. Not since Maleficent has the villain's plot been more frightening and never, neither before nor since, has said plan been fueled by as much self-righteousness. Frollo was a priest in the book, but changed to a judge in the movie to avoid any controversy. But you can bet your bottom dollar that he uses his position of authority to abuse his power and change the world as he sees fit. But enough about Obama. Quasimodo does finally get his chance during the Festival of Fools. There, he can pass his ugliness off as a mask and finally see the world for himself, or at least the urban streets of Paris. He is eventually ousted, earning Frollo's displeasure, but not before befriending the gypsy Esmeralda. She shows him a kindness no one else had, and is the first person Quasimodo ever sees stand up to Frollo. Shenanigans ensue, Quasimodo almost believes Frollo was right about the world and would likely become obedient once again if not for Esmeralda standing in opposition of everything Frollo has taught him. Which is only furthered when Esmeralda finds herself stuck in Notre Dame and Quasimodo helps her out. When people talk about this film, the first words that flow from their mouth is hellfire. The deepest, darkest and most demented song in the Disney canon by a country mile. But what I find fascinating is that it's actually a companion song with Heaven's Light, a slow, somber song that builds up to an immaculate chorus before the scene transitions. Now, I am neither a music critic nor an animation expert. All I can accurately judge on is what looks and sounds good to me. So, take my criticism with a grain of salt when I say, Jesus, is this scene good? The line work, the fluidity, the scorching colors and lighting. You really see Frollo's twisted inner turmoil as he's torn between filling his self-righteous war on the gypsies and his equally unscrupulous adulterous desires. Meanwhile, Quasimodo is just torn between wanting to experience more of that warm and loving glow and knowing that most of the French are cruel to people like him. What we have here is a dual character study and a lesson on pride and humility. By the movie's end, Frollo literally falls into hellfire because of where his pride and lust take him. Whereas Quasimodo is eventually welcomed by the people of Paris. Sure, he didn't get the girl. To read a YouTube comment, Quasimodo treated Esmeralda as an angel, Frollo treated her like a demon, but Phoebus saw her as a human being. But Quasimodo got something so much more. Something he always wanted to be accepted, to be proven wrong on what Frollo had been teaching him, 
to be embraced by heaven's light. All of this is articulated with this musical number. All the themes are on full display with some powerful music backing it. That's why this is the most important scene. Morning in Paris, the city awakes to the bells of Notre Dame. 